we're going to talk about non-conceptual knowledge. This is perfect wisdom, or we call prajna. How do we have this prajna? We will talk about this non-conceptual knowledge explained in the Mahayana Sangriya by Bodhisattva Asanga. First, let's look at the five facets. First, self-nature. What's the self-nature? It's a void of five characteristics. Number one, it's not absent of thinking. It's not the state where we're sleeping or when we are drunk or when we are unconscious. That is not what we call non-conceptual knowledge. Number two, it's not the state where we exclude and surpasses the stage of investigation and analysis. There are three realms in this world. There's realm of desire, realm of form, and realm of no form. We are in the realm of desire. We have desire such as for food, for sleep, and for lust. The heavenly beings in the world of form, they have meditative abilities. They don't have these worldly desires. Therefore, they are born in the realm of form. There are four types of jhanas in this realm of form. First jhana, second jhana, third jhana, and fourth jhana, depending on their meditative absorption. This non-conceptual knowledge is not like the heavenly beings of the first jhana or the second jhana. Because the first jhana, they use investigation and analysis. They use their thinking to let go of their desires. Heavenly beings in the second jhana, they surpass investigation and analysis. So this non-conceptual knowledge is not what the heavenly beings have. They let go of their investigation and analysis. That is still not wisdom of the bodhisattvas. Number three is not cessation of identification and sensation. This is heavenly beings. This is arhats. The third level arhats, they are saints. They let go of the idea of the self. They go into this deep meditation. It's called cessation of identification and sensation. Basically, they can be in the state without feelings and without thinking. They are in this deep samadhi. But is that what we call non-conceptual knowledge? No. It's still not the mind without discrimination. Because our heads they still don't know the whole reincarnation is fake. So it's not the perfect wisdom yet. Number four, it's not a substance. You cannot say this non-conceptual knowledge is like a rock, just sits there, a material that doesn't think. That's not it either. It's not a material matter. Number five, it's not a description of reality. It's not something you learn and describe with words. This true suchness, this perfect wisdom cannot be verbalized, not descriptive, and cannot be conceptualized. You give it a name, give it analysis, that is still not it. In Zen Buddhism, when a student meditates, the teacher will use a stick to hit the disciple when he's meditating. Why? It's like we are all actors playing a role in a film. But we are so immense in this role, we forgot we are only playing a movie. When the master hits the student, is trying to wake him up from his delusion. Nothing in our life is real. So it's something not described or experience with words. It's just an awakening when your wisdom unfolds. So we understand this wisdom of emptiness by knowing what it is not. It's not the absence of thinking when we're unconscious. It's not the heavenly beings state of meditation. It's not the third level arhats. It's not a material substance and it's not describable with words. So what is it? What is this non-conceptual knowledge? Now we look at its other facets. Two, what is the basis of this non-conceptual knowledge? It is neither mind nor non-mind. 
the basis of this perfect wisdom, what we call prajna, to realize emptiness. We cannot say it's mind or non-mind. It's not mind because it's non-conceptual. Conceptual is from the mind. Therefore, it's not the mind. It's not non-mind because it is still a knowledge. Knowledge is a derivative of mind. It's derived from mind, but it's not mind. We need to understand this true suchness, our Buddha nature, this perfect wisdom. We cannot call it mind or non-mind. It's just a state without using the deluded mind, discriminating and labeling everything like we are doing right now. It's just a state of perfect wisdom. Most of us don't understand the spaces. In the Shakama Sutra, Buddha asked Ananda, we are of the same family. Why did you decide to become a monk? Ananda said, Buddha, I saw your 32 characteristics. It's so supremely incredible and it's so incomparable. That's why I want to be just like you. Buddha said, you do not know your mind. That is not a good intention to become a monk. You don't know the meaning of cultivation. What is the basis of your cultivation? You must start from the point of true suchness. There's nothing to gain and nothing to desire. There's neither mind nor non-mind. Three, what is the cause of the non-conceptual knowledge? Hearing propensity coming from speech. You want to have this wisdom, you still have to use words and language. Propensity coming from speech. You need to learn Mahayana Sutras, the great vehicle about perfect, excellent wisdom of emptiness. For example, in the Perfect Enlightened Sutra, it says to know illusion is to depart from it. To depart from illusion is to be enlightened. What is the key here? To know everything is illusory. Once you know, it's really like playing a role in a film. It's an illusion. Then you depart from the solution. You no longer attach to everything that's going on in your life. You're not emotionally disturbed by all the adversities, sickness, poverty, or relationship problems. That shouldn't disturb you from your true suchness. That is enlightenment. If you don't learn sutras, how are you going to have this knowledge? Number four, what is the object of non-conceptual knowledge? It is true, non-substantial nature. True suchness, as we said before, is truly empty and truly non-empty. It doesn't have any substance. We are attached to an idea of the self. Everything in the world is real. We have these two delusional views. That's why we cannot become a Buddha. Now it's telling us it's truly empty. Empty of a self. Empty of all Dharma. Realize this non-substantial nature, which means everything has no self-essence, no intrinsic value of its own. It's all condition arising Nothing is for us to rely on. Understand impermanence of all the condition arising, then we can truly let go and detach. That's why in the Heart Sutra, it says, perceive that the five aggregates are empty, thereby transcend all sufferings. How do we transcend all the delusion in our mind? First, we need to perceive that our five aggregates are empty. Form, our body, our feelings, our perception, our mental formation, and our consciousness. In the body and mind, there is not a me. We need to know this. 
then that is non-conceptual knowledge. So the object of non-conceptual knowledge is this true empty nature. Five, the aspect of non-conceptual knowledge is absence of mark. In all Mahayana sutras, the essence of the sutra is to realize the real mark, which means our true suchness. Absent of any mark, you cannot give it a name or give it a form or give it any appearance. It's absent of any form. It's truly empty. We forcefully call it true suchness, but there's actually no such thing. It cannot be described verbally. So do not be attached to a concept called suchness even what is non-conceptual knowledge because when you're attached to any name that is not it anymore so be free from all mark from the mark of a self of others of sentient beings and lifespan this is according to the diamond sutra time and space you and me everything is conditioned arising when you realize this, that is true emptiness. You don't have binary thinking about the world. You don't think in terms of dualism. Now let's look at the three types of non-conceptual knowledge. First is called preparatory non-conceptual knowledge. This is when we are still learning. We are still using the sutras to learn about non-conceptual knowledge. You still need to use words in the beginning. You still need to think correctly about the sutra. What is this perfect wisdom? What is this prajna? Then we will come to the second type, fundamental non-conceptual knowledge. This is when you already got it. You succeeded in realizing emptiness. When you experience emptiness of the mind, you are a master of your mind. You can be still in your mind without wandering thoughts, without false thinking. All Buddhas must obtain this fundamental non-conceptual knowledge in order to reach Buddhahood. Lastly is the subsequent non-conceptual knowledge. This is when you use your non-conceptual knowledge to save all sentient beings. You come to this world as a bodhisattva. You take rebirth in reincarnation because you want to help all sentient beings to become enlightened. You understand emptiness and you understand existence. You use this existence to become a real bodhisattva. You have great compassion, tolerance, loving kindness toward all sentient beings. You foster great relationships with everybody around you because you want to deliver them. You no longer criticize others or think of other people's faults. Your only concern is to benefit all sentient beings. Wisdom always go with compassion. So the subsequent non-conceptual knowledge is when you have this natural compassion. You are not disturbed by any gain or loss, honor or dishonor, praises or blames, pain or happiness. None of your life situation will affect you emotionally because you already got this fundamental non-conceptual knowledge. You're all set. That's why you can be a true bodhisattva practicing the six paramita because you already have the perfect wisdom the last parameda. All your parameters become perfections. So this is the key to being a bodhisattva. You must have fundamental non-conceptual knowledge, which is knowing emptiness, and you have subsequent non-conceptual knowledge, which is compassion. So wisdom and compassion, that makes up a bodhisattva. How do we get to this level? A very useful tool is actually chanting Buddha's name, Amitabha. We want to renounce all our worldly desires. 
to leave samsara and go to the Western Pure Land. By chanting all the time, you remind yourself everything is fake here. You chant Buddha's name undividedly, your mind will be still without a lot of discrimination. So chanting is actually the best tool to realize the non-conceptual knowledge one day. Recite the name Amitabha till the flowers flourish and the Buddha comes into view. What does that mean? When the flower bloom is when you have fundamental non-conceptual knowledge. Then you will see the Buddha within you. That's when your true suchness really unfolds. That's when your flower is blooming and you see the Buddha inside of you. That's the level of enlightenment and Buddhahood we want to reach. That's the class for today. Thank you for listening. Amitabha.